As mentioned, today is the 10th installment and this virtual platform has given us many opportunities to visit museums around South Africa, which have of course been closed during um, the lockdown period. But we're very excited today to be visiting a beautiful little gem of a museum in Riversdale, uh, the Julius Gordon Africana Museum. And today we are going to be joined by quite a few speakers from the museum who will give us a little bit of history about the museum, um, the contents of it, as well as how they are planning for the future of the museum. So I just would like to thank not only our viewers uh, for the talk today, but also our speakers. I'm just going to do a quick introduction. We are joined by um, Mr. and Mrs. Hirsa of the museum who have been involved for several years. And we are also joined by the curator of the museum, Mrs. Louise de Pissy. And a familiar face to our Strauss & Co. Zoom talks is art writer and journalist Amanda Buerta. So we are very excited to have all the speakers join us today to give us a little bit of insight into the Julius Gordon Africana Museum in Riversdale. And we're really looking forward to it today. Um, as you may or may not know, our Zoom talks are all recorded. So we are going to be loading this onto our YouTube channel uh, in a few days. So should you miss any part of it or want to share it with family or friends, the link will be on our YouTube channel. So please feel free to share that. Um, but just before we start, as I see we are getting to 4 p.m. and we have quite a few people joining us. I would just like to once again say thank you very much for joining us for the 10th installment of Strauss & Co's Museum Moments. And thank you very, very much to our speakers today at the Julius Africana, uh, sorry, Julius Gordon Africana Museum in Riversdale. Uh, just before we also start, I would just like to mention that due to um, the COVID regulations, our speakers are all at their own computers today. So if you wouldn't mind just giving us a few seconds between to open and close the, the slideshows. So just bear with us in between, but thank you very much for joining. And with that, I will hand over to Mrs. Hirsa who will start off the talk today. Thank you very much, Mrs. Hirsa. Thank you. If you travel by car from Cape Town in a northeasterly direction on the N2 highway, you will after about three hours reach the town of Riversdale. It's the westernmost point in the Garden Route region, and it's an area of great scenic beauty, as you will see as you drive along. The town lies against the backdrop of the majestic Langeberg Mountains. To the north, there's Riversdale, the mountains. Riversdale is known for her abundance of indigenous fanboys. The town hosts a popular flower show every September. When the fanboys is in bloom, the felt packs on very lovely colors. The environment has been the subject of many paintings by many South African artists. Perhaps the best known of these are Jan Ernst Forskink and his daughter Vera Forskink. He, Jan, was an artist, but he was also a passionate botanist. This is a painting by Jan Forskink of Heather beneath the Langeberger. However, he had to make a decision as to whether he would be a botanist or an artist and he chose painting as his life's work, becoming a professional artist in 1904 at the age of 51. This is another beautiful work of his called Sunshine and Shadow. Now of nine daughters that he had with his wife, Helen, Vera the eldest was the only one who followed her father as an artist. He painted a beautiful portrait of her. Just look at that colouring. Now she painted the same kind of landscape in the same area as her father. This painting is of vineyards in the autumn. 
We'll have more to say about these artists later on. Riversdale is a hub for shopping and other services for surrounding farming communities, smaller towns and coastal resorts. But it's not an ordinary town. It has a number of charming surprises. The first is a natural phenomenon. When you look up at the Langeberger, the outline of the sleeping beauty overlooking the town becomes clear. If you look at this towards the left, you will see sleeping beauty there. From the right angle, you can even see her eyelash. And she has an expression of slight petulance. Riversdale has a rich cultural heritage and many architectural treasures, but one of its best kept secrets is the Julius Gordon Africana Center. Housed in an interesting building that used to be a private residence and now belongs to the Hesequa municipality. Several distinguished persons served as curators over the years. Sadly, in recent years, this little gem did not receive the attention it deserves for a number of reasons, among them financial constraints. For a time, there was no curator, but Jessica was fortunate in having the services of Mr. Johan Lachranzi, a volunteer who welcomed visitors and delighted in showing them the collection. But since June 2016, I am happy to say, a dedicated curator, Mrs. Louise Duplessis, has been in place. The center is once again keen to serve its original purpose, which is to draw in visitors and also to delight and educate the local people, especially, of course, school children. We would like to thank Strauss and Company for the opportunity to make the Julius Gordon Africana Center more widely known. And thanks to Mr. Kruvier Koch for the excellent photos that he took to help us produce this program. Welcome to the Julius Gordon Africana Center, Fassfeld House. You may ask where this name comes from. Julius Gordon was born in Riversdale on the 27th of December, 1892. He was a lawyer and became an avid artist, collector, discerning, acquire, sorry, acquiring his extensive collection over many years. A portrait of him by Martinez Lachranzi, which is an oil on canvas, is included in the art collection in the center. Julius Gordon's cousin, Mrs. Lily Duplessis, Nee Gordon, of whom we also have a portrait, is by E.A. McKenzie. One day, Lily inquired from Julius what he was going to do with his possessions, as he was a bachelor. He gave this some thought and in 1952 decided to bequeath his collections to the municipality of Riversdale. Lily, we shall see, was a resourceful lady interested in the arts and we shall meet up with her again. Julius had a good friend, Theodore, called Doric Fassfeld. He was born on the 27th of February, 1889 and also qualified as a lawyer. Fassfeld was also a bachelor and probably with some encouragement from Mrs. Lily Duplessis, decided to bequeath the family home and the earth of 29 to 31 Long Street, Riversdale to the municipality and the town of Riversdale with one extremely important condition. Julius Gordon's bequest was to be permanently displayed within Fassfeld House. <laughs> Sorry if I interrupt you. We, I'm just not seeing your lovely screens with your with your beautiful photos of the paintings. I'm just wondering if we can click through to those. I, there we go. Fantastic. Shall, we go? Shall I go back? No, no, no. Just go on where you went on. I just wanted to show people the beautiful portraits that you would have. Uh, okay, there we go. On Doric's demise in 1960, the house was readied for the the future use that it was going to be put to. Uh, the house was going to be called, or had to be called, Fassfeld House. Um, the center itself was in the Julius Gordon Africana Center and Fassfeld House. 
Our first plaque shows the Rivers family crest. The permission was given by the family for it was to be used as Riverdale, Riversdale's coat of arms after the town was named after Harry Rivers. The following plaque indicates that Julius Gordon bequeathed his collections in memory of his parents, David Gordon Sr. and his mother, Selina, who lived in Riversdale from 1890 to 1907, and thereafter on the farm called Love Spot till 1917. On the 6th of May, this center was officially opened and received the plaque marking it as a national heritage site, then called a national monument. By way, by why it is not called a museum is that it was one of Julius Gordon's stipulations. He wanted it to be an interesting place where people, both young and old, could appreciate and enjoy and learn in some way or other all that was displayed, including the articles that residents had also brought here and donated. The nature of the bequest has proven to be a strength and a weakness by not identifying the specific topic for its collections other than the items he bequeathed. It also allowed donors to widen the scope of the donations. Consequently, it has become a mix of valuable cultural remains of yesteryear. This allows it to be a record of town life in the earlier years, while it is also serving as a repository of valuable artworks and also artifacts. Uh, for years, people have been encouraged to collect according to their own interests, and the large collection, for instance, uh, the Stone Age artifacts, is a case in point. It is a sign of a town with a lively intellectual life. We are fortunate to have the positive support of the Hesequa municipality. But the fact that it is not specifically mandated by the Constitution to so involve itself in um, heritage matters is a point of constraint for the Julius Gordon Africana Center, Fasfeld House. The history of this program actually dates back to 2009, when one of the previous mayors uh, out of his own discretionary fund, made funds available to have the Julius uh, Gordon art collection evaluated properly. Uh, I was asked to intercede in the matter and eventually Amanda was asked to do it. And when she became involved with this series of uh, programs, she obviously thought it might be appropriate if it could be arranged uh, to have the center uh, reflected in the program series itself. Now, we, of course, uh, immediately thought that the first thing to do would be to get the uh, necessary approvals, because, of course, it is, as you have learned, the property of the Hesuqua mm -hmm. municipality. Now, at the outset, then, uh, I am representing Mr. Hartnick, who is the deputy mayor and uh, <clears throat> couldn't be here today and he's asked me to make his position quite clear so that when we look at the future possible futures of the uh, collection it, it may serve as a guide now the first thing he asked me to do once again was to make a strong vote of thanks to strauss and company amanda who did the original work Javier Koch, who did the very onerous job of the photography, uh, frankly, uh, with a torn retina. And uh, it was very difficult because the light was, was problematic, as was the glass. And of course, a vote of thanks to Louise Duplessis, currently the curator, uh, and a curator who cares very deeply for her work. Now, <clears throat> The uh, Hartnick opinion on this is that the Julius Gordon is an extremely valuable uh, <clears throat> number of collections and the, <clears throat> the nature of the collections is of extreme importance. This, for instance, is 
series of artifacts comes from uh, Blombos. And as you know, Blombos is probably one of the important agricultural sites in anthropology. The second is a series of artifacts coming from the uh, <coughs> Pinnacle Point. And again, this is extremely important uh, because the scientist in control, uh, Curtis Marion, is of the opinion that this is where Homo sapiens may have survived during a great coll collapse of population round about uh, 160,000 years ago. Now, these collections are of extreme importance, of course, and they will be housed in their own museums later uh, once the funds can be found. To me, uh, <coughs> from the municipality's point of view, we see uh, these collections of being a record of a cultural uh, development of a town that was ex very lively. Riversdale of that age uh, produced artists, uh, poets, writers, botanists, archaeologists, you name it, and they were there. And the reason for this simply is because uh, the collections were made diverse and it was quite acceptable to be interested in stones and artifacts. This was not str strange at all. So if we were to produce a sort of a roadmap for the way forward, one would like perhaps to write a wish list and it would be that Riversdale would have a wider anthropological footprint than it currently has. Furthermore, uh, due to the whole uh, economic decline, Pinnacle, uh, the um, public support has dissipated and that needs to be enhanced again. Of course, it is currently used as an educational instrument, but that can be expanded. And we would like it to, to be extended as an ancillary art uh, facility. In this time and age, of course, tourism is of extreme importance and we would like very much uh, to see our B&Bs benefit from large numbers of visitors. We shall discuss this a bit later as well. All right, the paintings he acquired during his lifetime form an important element of the collection of the, of the Julius Gordon. Now, I'll be discussing some of these works with Amanda Buerta, who joins us, I hope, from Cape Town. Amanda, some time ago, you came to Riversdale to evaluate the collection in the Julius Gordon, and you described it as a small gem and a cultural benefit. What specially impressed you about it? Well, I was very surprised to find such a fine collection, which is so totally unknown, Riversdale, and also the quality of work, and especially the surprises of the Africana collection, which we have. I believe you consider the Forskeng family, which produced three generations of artists, to be of central importance. That would be Jan Ernst Forskeng, his eldest daughter, Vera, and a granddaughter, Helene Forskeng Gerard, who died tragically in a car accident when returning home from her mother's funeral. Yes, they have become, uh, one could consider them as very synonymous with the Hesiqua re region. And Jan Forskink was the first full-time professional artist in South Africa in 1904, as you already mentioned, at the age of 51. Um, he, when he was just, he, he only married uh, four years prior to that, so it shows one's the kind of courage that he had to take such a step at that time. I want to just add that he, when he joined in 1904 as the first professional uh, artist in South Africa, he was followed by Nudir, uh, Hugo Nudir, 
and shortly afterwards by Pirne. Um, uh -huh. Horskik was born in Riversdale and his birth house is still standing there, which is a Malkhout's Kral, Malkhout's Kral, which is on a farm outside of Riversdale. He was also educated in Riversdale and he settled after his marriage uh, in, the in, in Riversdale uh, at what called Cypress Lodge, which is in the main road of Riversdale. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a studio, I believe, at the back, right next to the garden, where his nine daughters probably played and made a terrific racket. I think he must have had great powers of concentration. Yes, indeed. He was, a, he was very active there in the community, and at school, a school and a street was named after him. And in 1978, a set of stamps was issued depicting his works. He did not hold many exhibitions. But it was not uh, many exhibitions. One was held, the first one was held uh, in early 1990. Uh, this shows this particular cover. It was not in the real sense an exhibition as we know it together. Uh, it was presented at the, uh, presented by Ernest Lazard, uh, who was an auctioneer at his sales rooms uh, in uh, Fox Street, Johannesburg. And there were 41 paintings to be seen and the same evening it was put on auction and within two hours the entire group of paintings were sold. So this is a very fortunate way of presenting your first solo exhibition. Mm -hmm. And this was the kind of trend which uh, Falskin then followed with his works. Uh, he used a kind of, he used the, this facility that Lazard offered him as a kind of preview, to offer a preview exhibition so to speak for the same day at the evening to have it auctioned. Uh, he had a similar experience with the Ashby's galleries in Cape Town, where he also exhibited in the same way, a kind of show in the morning and the evening and uh, an auction of the work. But important mm -hmm. is that in the, during the Cape Town exhibition, of his Cape Town visit, which is in 1922, that was the time when he first met Cape artists such as uh, Gregor Brunsire and others. And, but I want to just say something that these way of exhibiting with the auction afterwards the, received a lot of publicity and especially in the local newspapers and through, uh, through word of mouth uh, he received many commissions afterwards as mm -hmm. far as the then Rhodesia and Southwest Africa. But there was wow. this interesting thing too that uh, he used Emil Streichardt in Pretoria, which is well known mm -hmm. for his support to artists, uh, to prepare his canvases for him and sometimes it is framing. And, but uh, Streichardt also offered him another kind of first for the South African artist, and that is he printed the first four color prints of works of, uh, uh, of works of Falskin, which was available in 1924, and it was so popular that it was reprinted and various uh, more paintings were uh, printed in the same fashion. So there was the oil, the works on oil, and in a sense also a printed copy, which was uh, very, I think, sold for a shilling each. Uh, it was interesting, this little point I would like to add to it, that uh, at, at Stillby lived a carpenter called uh, Evert Scott, Evert Scott. He was the father of the well-known writer Dalian Matia, and he did the framing for all of uh, Falskink for the local market. Now, Falskink always had the dream and the great ambition to be accepted, painting of him to be accepted at the Royal Academy of Arts in London, and uh, he was offered, he was allowed to offer such a painting, The Mountains of the Peru, in 1950 through uh, the help of the High Commissioner in London, but it was sadly rejected. And the rejection note reads, unfortunately, the framing is not suitable. Uh, and he then, a repro he then offered this painting uh, to the Royal Institute of Painters of Oil Colors in London, where it was fortunately accepted. So he had quite a, a, a tough time to to get that acknowledgement, but he was very happy to finally could have that on his CV, that he had in fact 
a painting accepted in London. Not his ideal, but nevertheless what he thought mm -hmm. would be best for him. All right. After his death, an, a memorial exhibition of his works was held by the South African National Gallery. Yes, uh, uh, this was uh, quite interesting. Just to mention this, that uh, Forskank received very little, well, broad acknowledgement in his time through the marketing of his work. He was apparently a very fine uh, mark a salesman himself, and mm -hmm. uh, but he, he never had a proper exhibition where one could actually take note of his work. And uh, he mm -hmm. died in 1936, and uh, nine years later, a memorial exhibition uh, was held at the National Gallery, uh, which is a f the first one of this kind, out for a South African painter. We all know it was followed later with various of the other painters. But uh, again, uh, Paul Skink was the first one to be offered such an, uh, uh, an occasion. That's good to know. This is what he looked like. Yeah. I think he um, was a very handsome man. He was. Uh, this is a painting by his, his uh, granddaughter, Helene mm -hmm. uh, Forskin Garrard. No, and, she died uh, young, so tragically. Yeah. Who also mm -hmm. died young, tragically, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. And this is his granddaughter, that very yes. one that we are talking about. Yeah. Uh, but in between, we have had, we must just uh, spend maybe a moment also on uh, the very important contribution of Vera Falskin, uh, who yes. is his daughter. And yes. I would just like to uh, say uh, that uh, one of the interesting things that I heard was that uh, when she was born, uh, and he, they were thinking about the name, and he used various names mm -hmm. that they thought that they would name her, and finally decided to call her Vera. And he said he could just imagine, this was still a baby in arms, he could just imagine how beautifully the name Vera Falskink would be uh, on a canvas beneath a painting. So he had already those kind of ambitions for his daughter. For his but daughter. He was the only, yeah, she was the only one who followed mm. his uh, trend. And Vera mm. had a much more successful career than her father had. Uh, mm -hmm. In the sense that she had many more exhibitions, she also traveled uh, fairly extensively through South Africa and even parts of Africa. And uh, she held a number of uh, solo exhibitions that was also uh, very well supported. She was in many ways a very successful artist in her own right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the Julius Gordon has two uh, excellent works by Jan Forsking in the realist tradition. Um, this one, I believe, dates to 1966. And then in the collection, we also have Montague Pass, uh, entered by Jan Forsking. Now, as you say, Vera followed her father, and um, we have one painting by Vera in the uh, collection. It's this one. Um, there is actually another large painting by Vera Forskink around 4.5 by 2.5 meters, known locally as the Big Vera, which is very striking but currently hangs in the town hall. This is mostly locked so people don't see it, which is a pity. So I agree. I, I saw this and I believe that uh, it was uh, quite in a bad uh, Condition. And yeah, yes. bad condition. Yes. And it's original. Yeah. And then Vera it. it, I believe, herself again. Yes. Yes, this I believe so. Yeah. yeah. I believe that she restored it and improved it. And this is what it looks like. We're looking at it. And I think it is absolutely beautiful and does deserve to be more widely known. Now, another resident of Riversdale who became a renowned artist was Johannes Mankis. He was friends with Jan Forskink as a child, wasn't he? Yes, he was actually uh, sort of also friendly with Vera, Vera uh -huh. Forskink, uh -huh. and, yeah. uh, and met uh, Forskink, uh, obviously her father uh, through Vera, and mm. I believe that he often sat in the studio with mm. uh, with Falskink, watching him painting. Watching him paint, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. But, uh, we okay. had this painting by um, Johannes Mankis in the collection at the Julius Gordon. I think a very, very powerful uh, painting, Flower in Landscape. And he went to school in Riversdale, didn't he? Yes, he, he was born in Riversdale and he went to school there, but only for the, for the primary school his mother moved in, he and his mother moved in to Tamboorstuf in Cape Town, where uh, Mankis attended the Jan van Riebeek High School. And he mm -hmm. was the first pupil in the then Cape Department of Education who took art as a matric subject. And uh, they did not have those days uh, teacher artists at school, so the mm -hmm. artist Florence Zerfi was appointed to be his first art teacher. And okay. interesting, um, close next to, uh, next to, almost next to Riversdale, in that vicinity was also comes Frida Linde, who also was at Jan van Riebeek, and uh, she joined the art class with Mankis. And she mm -hmm. became later, of course, the celebrated Afrikaans children's book writer. Yes, yes. Now, the Julius Gordon also has this self-portrait by Mankis, and which I must say I find it very moving. Yes, uh, uh, Mankis did, of course, a number of self-portraits, but what was interesting about Mankis in this particular time is that he started his first, uh, he, he started the first journal. He published already a number of his journals, three were published, but then he started one at the age of three. And he started wow. to write, uh, he started Goodness to me. write in this, it was like the publish as Jürg mm. And no, this, really. particular, this particular uh, sketch is part of that uh, period which he associated himself with, with, uh, with Riversdale. But I can mm. just say, of course, uh, Mankis, as we all know, has become afterwards in Cape Town, quite a celebrated figure, mm. and he became very close with Maggie Lokshire and people like that, and was very mm. much influenced too by the expressionistic style in which uh, mm. Lokshire and Stern painted. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, the Julius Gordon is very proud of its example of the work of Omar Stern, the gosh, entitled Vegetable Cellars. I think a work full of energy. Yes. And you want to say something? Yes, well, I think that uh, that this sort of cele uh, uh, celebrated ex expressionist uh, that mm -hmm. both had a huge influence on, on Mankis and, and, mm -hmm. and also Lobsher, and this is very well seen through these particular works. Please continue. Uh -huh. There's Maggie Lobsher we have in the Julius Gordon, this example, Sunflowers and Duck. And then we, sorry? I, this is a very this, beautiful example of, of Maggie's. Very striking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, then we have an Erich Meyer landscape entitled Near Rastenburg, Machalisberg. I know his watercolors, which he did on St. Helena when he was a prisoner of war, yes. but this is a uh, very, um, I would say, lovingly rendered oil painting, right? Yes, yes, indeed he had. Uh, what is interesting it, to me, I find, the, I think there's another mayor also in the collection, but I find it interesting that uh, Julius uh, uh, Gordon, living at Riversdale, had collected sort of such an electric uh, uh, mm. number of, of especially landscape of, of that time, but that of course is sort of very well known. But what one finds so interesting about this particular painting and also the painting of Meyer in general is the very direct uh, sort of visual element that one mm -hmm. always sees in his work and which mm -hmm. is very decisive with him because uh, of that, I would think that his work became so well adopted uh, mm -hmm. by South, and with this intense South African ca character and actually very really popular with that uh, that kind of the, the beginning collectors of especially Afrikaans collectors in the 1910s till the 1930s and thereafter. Mm -hmm. Now I believe we can group some of the other artists in the collection together as K 
Cape Impressionists and artists of the new group as well as noting a common denominator of artists who actually saw service during World War II. Would you expand on that a bit? Yes, I would say that um, first of all, uh, the whole idea, the other uh, artists that we want to talk about would be uh, Venning and and Worth uh, yeah. works that we will show eventually. But what here is important is that in the period of uh, 1910 till 1930 was an important stage in the development of what was later termed the Cape Impressionists. Uh -huh. And at that time, a small group of European trained uh, painters were struggling uh, to adopt to their palettes uh, after the return and to capture the indigenous light and colors of, of the mm -hmm. Cape. You mm -hmm. know, he established the sort of Cape Impressionism and mm -hmm. the uh, adaptation of the European uh, Impressionists. Uh, artists such as Benning, Nita Spolaas, Ruth Prowses, Caldecott, and various mm -hmm. others uh, actually followed that particular trend. Right. Well, we, by have the a, we have a Peter Benning, uh, which is in the Julius Gordon collection, and Gregor Benzire we have yeah. as well. Uh, well, one could just say in brief that with uh, Gregor, with uh, Peter Venning, uh, Peter Venning, of course, uh, was a very important influence also on the development of Gregor Benzire. He moved, uh, after having lived in Pretoria, he moved to Cape Town uh, in around about 19... 12, 13 in that year, and he befriended a uh, DC mm -hmm. Wunsire, who was uh, Wins, uh, uh, Gregoire's father. And Venning uh, uh -huh. sort of easily adapted to the Cape situation here. One felt that he was also felt quite comfortable here. And this is uh, a scene which I think is called Weinberg, in the Weinberg vicinity, where the Wunsires at the time lived. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have this one also by Bunsire. Yes, this Bunsire. is a, a relatively early Bunsire, um, mm -hmm. which was uh, after, you know, this was an early Bunsire, around about the, uh, towards the end of the, the 1928 there around. Mm -hmm. It's called Winter Clouds. Yes. Yes. Now, well, I believe, I, yeah. Uh, I just want to say that uh, the association with Gregor and his mentor, uh, which is now uh, winning, Bonsai mm -hmm. was invited, uh, uh, with Gregor Bonsai was invited by Julius Gordon to stay with him in, in, in Riversdale. And I suspect that this is the way how uh, he also, in a sense, befriended uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe uh, Winning, because there was this connection between them. Wernsai, uh, of course, traveled extensively in the Cape uh, area at that particular time, because he traveled to all the rural areas, to school talks, as well as trying to sell his work to interested buyers. And this mm -hmm. is how I believe that he, con he had contact with uh, Solomon, uh, with uh, Julius Gordon, by selling uh, the work in Riversdale when he came there to give a talk to the high school there. Later on, uh, of course, Bonsai returned uh, on various occasions to Riversdale because we are know there's a number of paintings that he had done on various mm -hmm. trips uh, to Riversdale. So, mm -hmm. and of course, Bonsai was the founder of the new group and the majority of the artists in the collection of uh, uh, Julius Gordon uh, were also in one way or another members of the uh, connected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believe you wanted to discuss and Kevin go together. The collection has one clicker, the Stansha, which is oil on board. Yeah. I would say that uh, all that I want to say here in connection with this that of course uh Burns uh, uh like painting uh, Jammer, uh, uh, Bonsai, like Falskin, also uh, did uh, later years quite a number of beautiful and evocative paintings uh, celebrating the fauna and the flora and the people of the southern of southern Africa, and also travelled in 
in that particular re region. And these beautiful landscapes of, of that particular time. But Francois Prichel and mm -hmm. Terence Bourbeau were also both uh, official war artists uh, together. Uh -huh. And we have in the collection several painting go. This is um, copies near Good House. Uh, and then we have a packing shed. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, I find the... yeah, my favorite, I wanted to say my favorite McGoo is in Kitchen. Look at that one. I like that one so much. Um, well, uh, depth and rhythm. I just want to say that about Terence McCaw, uh, he idolized the work of, of Cezanne, actually, and was strongly influenced by the post oh. French post-impressionists. Mm and usually displaying a light paint application with very sensitive and linear brush strokes and detail. McCaw's mm -hmm. technique uh, mm -hmm. was based on the Impressionist principles, uh, which he advocated by Suzanne. And when he came to, uh, when he started to work in the Cape area where he later lived, uh, he worked with more in, he, he, you had to work more in this light as you have just portrayed in this beautiful mm. thing and was very much also mm. attracted mm. to the rural areas of the western plain. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. As I said, yes. like, like Francois Brieger, uh, Mokko uh, <laughs> later lived in Hart Bay. Uh, they were both uh, official war artists during the Second World War and it was interesting that uh, uh, Terence McCaw was also very attracted to painting the Cape Harbors and the fishing boats, etc. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. while Krieger was focusing mostly on more the rural aspects of the Western Cape. Yes. Then in the collection, we have Alexander Rose. Um, this is, I believe, a uh, yes. worm boat. Yeah, uh, Rose Innes was, of course, also one of the, considered to be one of the Cape um, uh, Impressionists. And he was, uh, uh, he was a painter of the sort of everyday situations, a uh, woman sitting, flowers, mm -hmm. etc. And he mm -hmm. had a particular interest in the scenes of uh, the Malay quarters and District 6 and such like. Later on, he became, uh, mm -hmm. started little landscape paintings when he went uh, on various mm -hmm. trips, there was, he belonged to a society uh, where they had little trips, day trips into, uh, into aspects of the Western Cape and places and into Manamakula mm -hmm. where they painted for the weekend and so on. But what is here interesting is that when a Rose Innes work, when one can actually describe as, as as I said, form, it, form part of the Cape Impressionist tradition and this influence in the major uh, exponents of, of that particular idiom. He was a, a conservative kind of artist and he pursues an innovation for the sake of innovation and not necessarily uh -huh. following any fashionable trends. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then we have Neville Lewis with this portrait which is, uh, I think, uh, very unusual. Yes, it, well, Neville Lewis, is, uh, yeah. Lewis was uh, uh, born in Cape Town and he was considered, especially in the 40s, to be uh, South Africa's premier uh, society portrait. And Lewis was steeped in the traditions of the British painting and uh, internalized a mm -hmm. high degree of style of special especially Augustus John. But what is interesting that mm -hmm. in South Africa, besides the painting of portraits and important colonial uh, personalities, he also went in quest of the rural subject, the South African equivalent, one could say in a sense, uh, the native sitters uh, that he rendered, the mm -hmm. sort of romanticized, exhaust, uh, exhausted, uh, the exotic, the romanticized, exotic. Mm -hmm. And what what is important mm. here is that he painted a number of these life in the rural South African scene, which has vanished. And he, like many other uh, artists at that particular time, uh, were interested in the 
native study and they went in pursuit of the African uh, in a natural state or in, uh, to, to be painted. But what struck me is that the, non, uh, that, uh, the large number of Lewis portraits of the rural black people uh, as well as portraits of black soldiers, which he painted, who returned after World War II. None of them uh, has got a name. He only named, the only painter, uh, the only painting that he had named of one of his black sitters was that of uh, uh, Chief Albert Latuli. But uh, he never named any of these uh, sitters, which I find is actually quite sad. This is a beautiful portrait. It of is, that it is, it is. Mm. Yes. Now, the Julius Gordon has one Marjorie Wallace, but I think it's a very fine work of hers called Boat and Birds. You want to comment on that one? Well, I think this this work of, of Marjorie, uh, this is a particularly beautiful example of Marjorie's work, which was done shortly yeah. after she arrived in Cape Town, which which was around about 1956-1957 and she and Jan Rabi, her husband, traveled fairly extensively around the Cape Coast and this is one of the favorite sort of spots that Marjorie uh, went to. This, I suppose, is maybe at, at uh, uh, Varnes Kranz Arniston, that is one of the favorite Could spots. Be of a Marjorie, would Could you be. say? That you, yeah, and yes. I also thought yes. that... Yes, she did other paintings there. She did, yes, she did other paintings there as well. And um, mm. I would say this, that uh, what is interesting, it's for me very interesting that um, her connection with uh, Julius Gordon, uh, Marjorie was uh, at a very strong connection with the Cape Jewish community. And, um, and mm -hmm. she befriended, uh, she was act in, in fact quite politically active and was uh, in a sense um, sort of a, a liberal at the time and it was interesting with the support that she has arrived, that she got one would think that Afrikaans speaking people were the first people to buy her work but it was not so, it was actually the Jewish, mm -hmm. Jewish community Jewish who supported mm -hmm. her and amongst them, uh, Solomon. This year, amongst them, Julius Gordon. I just want to point out that from what I understand, that she sold more than one painting of uh, of hers to uh, Gordon. I, I just wonder where it is, or is it? I in don't know where they are because I don't think there's another one in the collection. But I could according be wrong. to my uh, according to Marjorie's notes, they must be. Is that so? All right. Well, we must find them. <laughs> Right, now we have a number of works by Katrina Harris um, in the collection, who was an outstanding graphic artist, right? Yes. And illustrated many works. Yeah. This she is was an illustration for Raka. Yeah, Raka. This was an example, of course, of Raka of N.P. van Weyklow, which was later mm -hmm. published in a, very li in a limited edition. Limited but, edition, right. Yes. And she has, uh, uh, she has a high standing as an artist and a graphic artist in particular. Mm -hmm. And Bekele, mm -hmm. she was a uh, very celebrated lecturer. And she also had, of course, very close connections with the Afrikaans literary world. And later yes. she became, um, uh, later on, she be, uh, uh, people became aware of the work that she has done and she has made quite a number of excellent portraits, also a very beautiful That's right. Portrait. That's yeah. right. This one is in the Julius Gordon collection, and I think it is a very beautiful one. Now, in my mind, her name is connected to that of Alba Boer, who was the famous writer of children's books. And Katrina illustrated a number of those, especially um, Stories van der Vierplans. You yes. remember that? Yes, yes. We grew up with those books, didn't we? I think we did. Yes. Now there's a single painting by John Henry Amshabich. He was a British-born artist, right? Yes, he was a British-born artist who specialized in historical murals. And he came to South Africa in 1916 and stayed for several years. And thereafter, 
he painted many South African commissions, such as for the South Africa House in London and the Pretoria City Hall. Yes, the Julius Gordon has an oil uh, on canvas painting by him. This is the one we're looking at at the moment. It's called Lighting of Candles, and it's dated 1937, which makes one think. This is a ritual that, according to my understanding, is very important to Jewish people, lighting candles. Um, there are several candle lighting rituals which are based on the comforting thought expressed in Proverbs 20, verse 27, that the life breath of man is the lamp of the Lord. Light betokens life. And there's a, a, a has painted the light so beautifully, hasn't he? Yeah. Well, uh, they are, of course, there was uh, also very really interesting is the uh, uh, Jewish community who lived in, in Riversdale for many years and supported the town in various mm -hmm. ways, as we see mm -hmm. now uh, the Gordon Collection. And of course, there are still, there are not many other Jewish uh, people still living in Riversdale, but uh, the, there is one famous man, one famous Jew still living there, Max Bays, who became the first international uh, rugby referee. Right, very famous person. Yes. Ah, another single word that we have is by Hodges. It's a hand painted engraving of Table Mountain and Cape Town. Well, I find this quite an unusual uh, item to be found in a private collection, I must say. I would consider this something more for a museum. This is museum quality and work mm -hmm. that should be there. This is, was one of my the pleasant surprises when I first viewed the Gordon collection. Collection, yes. Now, probably the pride of the Julius Gordon Center is the extensive Thomas William Bowler collection. We are going to show two examples. They were very difficult to photograph because they're um, all, of course, covered in glass and the lighting was a problem. But we can show two from quite an extensive collection. Thomas Bowler became, he was originally from England, right? But he became a famous colonial landscape artist in the early 19th century. He lived in the Cape of Good Hope for 35 years. And he made uh, paintings of the environment. We have this one of Simon's Town. I think it is uh, a Mr. lovely Simon's one. Town. You, you yeah. know, I would think that one of the, uh, talking about this, the, it is really surprising to find such a wonderful collection mm. of, uh, of the, uh, of, of, this whole series of paintings uh, mm. that has at the museum. And Bowler, mm -hmm. who arrived in 34 at the age of 21, initially was employed as an assistant to the Royal uh, Astronomer uh, of, of Observatory, which he also painted quite often. And he, and he soon acquired a kind of independence as an artist. His chief merit is in the role of the pictorial historian of the Cape Society in the pre-photographic area. Uh, mm -hmm. as a recorder of very important, uh, very important events from laying the first stone for the Table Bay breakwater to the arrival of the Confederate Raider, the Alabama. This mm -hmm. is the second largest collection of Bolus uh, after the Oppenheimer collection, which is housed in printers. And it is quite exceptional to have this in a private collection such as the Julian Gordon. You are indeed yes. very fortunate to have this collection. Yes, indeed. I leave you with this, which is um, at Malay Fisherman at Night, one of the bowlers. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. As we enter the building, we become aware of the beauty of all that is within and which is still lovingly being cared for. Besides the paintings, which have been discussed, there are many other interesting items in the collection. The antique stinkwood table has a serpentine top and cabriolet legs with scrolled carving and a center drawer with inlaid ivory and ebony initials, as you can see, SDT, SSM. 
two brass candlesticks of different heights are also part of his collection. Mr. Gordon's antique furniture also included the stinkwood and yellow wood three drawer commode adorned with a beautiful brass handles. The 19th century copper tart pan and lid would have been used to bake tarts in the open fire section in the kitchen. This large 18th century Cape Teak and brass mounted chest, believed to have come originally from Sutherland, um, is quite magnificent. It mostly would have been used uh, for carrying or keeping the guns of the, the owner, the Sunday best clothes of the family, and all their important documents, birth, christening, death, marriage certificates, and perhaps proof of granted and bought land. If the thatched roofed house should catch fire, this chest would have been the first item to save. There are many copper and brass articles that belong to Julius Gordon and apart from those that were used in the kitchen like pots and a kettle, wine measure and irons, there's a ship's lantern and christening bowl. Although not part of Julius Gordon's collection, this 19th century yellow wood and stinkwood washstand was donated by Dr. John Muir, who with Dr sorry, Mr. Yapi Dierkena played a pivotal role in the extension of this facility. The jug and bowl set was bought locally and Mrs. Leitner of Musenberg painstakingly restored it, which took her quite a while. Also to be seen is Julius Gordon's spinning wheel that was painted or sketched by um, um, sorry, <laughs> by Gregoire Buenzai on a visit to Julius Gordon. Julius Gordon also bequeathed this wonderful 19th century Jones and Company lock stitch sewing machine, which was made in 1882. The cabinet and the machine cover is made of walnut. There's a bust of Julius Gordon, which was sculpted by Mitford Barberton. This artwork has a remarkable presence. Included in his collection are also two handled Sheffield plate trays, one with a Rococo border and engraved floral motif, and the other with a grapevine motif and pierced work around the edges, one of which is shown here, unfortunately not. His Minton and Dresden porcelain items are also displayed. Julius Gordon obviously had a passion for long, place, long case clocks, as there are three in Fassfeld House. One particularly beautiful one is an English antique Georgian eight-day striking clock with a painted date and a second dial in a mahogany case with inlaid satin wood. Its maker was George Savage of Huddersfield. Of the many books he bequeathed, the most important would be Edna and Frank Bradlow's Thomas Bowler of the Cape of Good Hope, Dorothea Fairbridge's Historic Houses of South Africa, Johannes Schumacher's The Cape in 1776-77, Aquarelles, and A. Gordon Brown's Pictorial Art of South Africa during three centuries to 1875. Others are of historical value, like The History of South Africa by G. McCall Thiel, with a history starting with 1652. There is also a pair of French walnut Bergere chairs and various other particularly um, re, um, beautiful Regency and Victorian chairs and couches. One really interesting piece of furniture, if you can call it that, is a magnificent antique bound walnut container housing four cut glass decanters and six glasses in a drawer. In a passageway where many articles were donated by people from the community and elsewhere, there are more sewing machines and clothes and an organ made by Bell of Canada and belonged to the Jackson family, but also Julius Gordon's Edison gem phonograph and his, his master's voice record player. So all in all, a most substantial and valuable bequest, don't you think? One to be treasured for generations to come as Julian, J 
Julius Gordon wrote in his will. In an adjoining room, there's an assortment of donated articles dating back to the Riverside Shoe Factory here in Long Street with lasts and tools used there. It was owned by the Nankins. There are also articles from the Anglo-Boer War, including bullet pouches and gunpowder containers. All containers in those days for carrying water and anything else were made of wood, like the bucket and the box. A Jewish, the Jewish community, many of whose forefathers had fled Lithuania and settled here in Riversdale, were an integral part of the formation of businesses. With many families residing here, a synagogue was built. After almost four decades, it was sold when nearly all of the Jewish community had left Riversdale. They did, however, bring a few articles here for safekeeping, one of which is the Haggadah of Mr. A.B. Samuel. The only Jewish family remaining of the original ones that came out are the Nankins, who run a guest house here. Some, like the Sagors, still have connections with the residents of Riversdale or spend their holidays in Stolbay. The hearse was originally from here. It was loaned to von Weichstorp, whose driver there was Andres van Tonde. He used two pitch black horses to pull it. After it was returned, St. Andrew's Church in Riversdale used it, with Henry Kleinance being the last driver till a motorized hearse was bought. The kitchen of Fasfeld House is very much like it was way back then, with a lovely welcome Dover stove, but because it was relatively small uh, for the huge families, an open fire section helped to cook and bake the food. There, was a waff there is a waffle pan made in Germany, and with a whole recipe on the lid, mother had no excuse to remember the recipe. Clips were when on the one side is done. <clears throat> this was donated by Mrs. Marie Hiesa. There's also a washing machine donated by Linda, which very much reminds one of the campus Sputnik, but this one's water could be heated by the fire that you could make in the bottom. There are also examples of soap made in 19. 45 and a big iron soap pot with a butter churn, a coffee grinder, a sausage maker and butter pounder. There was little want for little more except an old buck went almost like a pizza oven built into the wall. The kitchen would have been the coziest room on a cold winter's day. Apart from Julius Gordon's book collection in yet another room, there are collections of archaeological Stone Age artifacts, slides of all the flora of this region taken, and shells collected by Mr. Yapi Diakona, who was known as the Walking Encyclopedia of Riversdale. There are also sea bean, there is also a sea, be, a sea bean collection of Dr. John Muir who was not only a medical doctor here in Riversdale, <clears throat> but also a revered botanist, an avid collector of antique furniture. What more does one need when trying to capture the past from the most valuable paintings to the most useful items in the kitchen? Hereby, we live and learn, which is what Julius Gordon wanted. From old to young, all are totally surprised by what they are privileged to enjoy, especially our many overseas visitors from across the world. In considering the future of the Julius Gordon, one must take note of the large amount of ground available. What this means simply is that there is a vast space which can be occupied by further building. There have, we have another scene of it, and this gives us an idea of one of the things one might consider doing there. What I'm showing you next will be three famous artists' studios to give some kind of an idea of what is required. 
Uh, this is Taliesin West's teaching studio. And just think of the marvelous educational work that could be done in something similar to this. Now, what could be envisaged would be that <coughs> a number of the local artists could on a regular basis come here and help senior school pupils uh, in master classes to encourage their work further. This is but one of the possibilities for enhancing the role of the Julius Gordon. This is one which you have already uh, will, will recognize, and this is the big Vera. What is interesting about it, it's a lovely, got a lovely story. It was actually painted first by a German itinerant artist called Gustav Mailand von Mullendorf. He used to go around local farmers painting murals on their homes. And he was known as Johnny Aldo's. He did this vast work on a flaxen cloth. And of course, later on, this became damaged. Uh, the lily that you have already met in terms of the bequests was equally active in restoring this painting. She took it upon herself to collect enough funds to effect it. Then she and Vera went to take advice from professional restorers in Cape Town, and then they started repairing it. Now, why do we think this is of use? Oh, good God. Imagine <coughs> this painting being displayed in a position which is available to the general public. Our feeling is that if uh, <clears throat> the water lilies can bring in millions of visitors to Paris, then certainly this big Vera can bring thousands to Riversdale to great benefit of the tourism industry. Now, a second possibility that one could <coughs> use to expand the function, and this would address the political wish that there be a bigger anthropological foot, uh, footprint is to have a small uh, exhibition of rock art at the Julius Gordon. Now, this is possible because Renee Rist spends her life going around the Langeberge and indeed the mountains of the Little Karoo and traces tracings. Now, her main work will eventually be housed in the Blombos Archaeological Museum, which one day will be built in Stilby. However, there is such a vast number of tracings available that one could have ancillary small uh, collections at numerous places, such as Heidelberg and Riversdale and Albertinia, with the result that you could actually have a rock art route, which would popularize the work tremendously. Now, this work, of course, is important because we're not keen to have the people visit them in situ for vandalism occurs. And uh, <clears throat> bringing them to the public this way is a very useful mechanism. Now, <clears throat> what the person must realize looking at this is that this is not graphic art in the way a Westerner sees it. This, in fact, is the experience of a shaman post-trance. After trance, they go into these remote places and paint their visions so that you get an idea of their value system and belief structure. Now, uh, <clears throat> I have selected a number of them, which we can speed through or we can take them slowly, depending on what you want. And <clears throat> what we really can see is that there is a lot of scope for a very valuable uh, tourist uh, 
and cultural experience. Uh, the first is that because these are post-trance, the trance dance, of course, is extremely important. And here are a number of examples. As you can see, <coughs> the routine movement uh, is there and eventually you go into a trance and you have your uh, psychotic experience and then eventually you uh, come out of it and this is when they go and do their rock art according to ethnographic uh, research. Now, the second aspect is that the Bushmen believed that the real world and the spiritual world is actually one universe. And interestingly enough, the rock face is seen as the boundary between these uh, various realities. And here you can see a hunter trying to move into the spiritual world. And there are a number of examples similar to this. Uh, <clears throat> here, of course, you can see this is an entrance into the spiritual world and you can see the animals bounding out. Here is a beautiful painting of a bush emerging from the rock. Again, stressing the fundamental uh, belief system. Now, because your belief of the reality is such that spirit and physical reality intermingle, you can have hybrid forms. This particular one clearly is a transmutation from human to fish. I show you one more example. <clears throat> Come on, there we go. And here again, this is a very well known uh, tracing uh, of what is known in the vernacular as a Vatermeide. It has a lovely story, and this is one of the things that could be used uh, to make the understanding of the Bushman culture far more widespread. Now, this tells us that we have the various uh, abilities to enhance the uh, Julius Gordon, the whole culture of the Bushmen also had belief in strong animals and the Eland being one of the primary examples. I'm uh, closing down with a, a number of pictures of that uh, phenomenon. Oh, good Lord. This was not supposed to be there, an elephant. Uh, which is related to water making. And here again, you have a buck coming from the rock. And here you have a bull. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Hirsa, as well as Mrs. Hirsa, and of course, Louise de Plessis and our guest speaker, Amanda Buerta, for putting this wonderful presentation together. I know you guys have been through, um, went through a lot of trouble to get the beautiful photographs for the presentation and also giving us your time on this Wednesday afternoon. I think we all agree that it was wonderful to meet this little gem. Unfortunately, we had to meet it virtually, but we really hope to come and visit Riversdale soon so we can visit the center and come and see the beautiful, not only other art collection, but also the vast array of objects that you have on display in the center. So once again, I would just like to say thank you very, very much for taking this time out of your busy schedule to do this presentation for us. I think I can say on behalf of Strauss and Company, but also the visitors that we really enjoyed it. And we look forward to coming to visit the center very, very soon. So um, on behalf of Strauss and Company, I'd like to say thank you very, very much. And we hope to see you all soon. <laughs>